Someone is trying to influence us almost every moment of every day. Computer, phone, smartphone, TV, print, you name it. All kinds of attempts to influence. They seem en influence us. They seem endless. Seems everybody's trying to do what my new phone app, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, <laughs> says influencing is. It says, to exert a power over mind or behavior, applying a force that is received without apparent exertion of force or direct exercise of command. We live in a culture of constant attempts to influence us, not only with advertisements, but I think among and within all of our human interactions. We seek to exercise our own influence every day in large and small ways, even though some of us may shrink back from it. And it's from this particular perspective I, I want to speak today. I want to call attention to one important ingredient that I think is often missing in the ways we try to influence others. Now, many of our efforts to affect the way someone thinks or behaves or how something happens is not influence at all. And it's certainly not art. And I think the overarching title of the TEDx talks is The Art of Influence. Our determination to convince each other of what we believe to right, or we believe is right, is an exercise often in manipulation or even coercion. And what passes for influencing others is often our efforts to show control over others with our words, maybe our money, our power, or simply a sense of what we believe is the correct way to think or act. We try to make people, make people, see it our way do it our way. All of us have opinions about right and wrong. We desire to make some kind of impact in shaping the world to our liking, or as we continually chant, to make a difference. Of course, the difference we want to be made coincides with the worldview we have and what we think will make things better, what we think should be done. How then can we exert that definition again, a power over the minds and behavior of others without apparent exertion of force or direct exercise of command? Our youngest daughter, Louisa, is now 26. She had sucked her thumb and nuzzled her blanket from the time she was two and a half years old. Yes, that was an odd time to begin. But trust me, the habit was well established, I would say immutable, by the time she was seven and a half years old and finishing first grade. By that time, my husband and I had succeeded only in getting her to leave the blanket at home most of the time. And the blanket was part of the thumb sucking deal. Sometimes she'd sneak it into the car when we'd go somewhere, <laughs> but we didn't allow it to be taken out into public. Okay. So it was the kind dentist, I believe, who said, her two front teeth are now coming in. It's time for you to stop her from sucking her thumb. It's going to cause problems. The teeth are going to stick out. Other problems are going to happen with her mouth if you let her keep this habit going. Okay. Our position as parents was right, okay? It was backed up by an expert. <laughs> There had to be a reduction of thumb sucking for the good of our little girl's future. 
This, however, I want you to know, was the same little girl, and I don't know if she was even 50 pounds at that time, that a couple years before, even littler, when I took her for her kindergarten vaccination, she had created World War III. <laughs> it took the doctor, two nurses, and myself, four people, to hold her down so she could get that shot. In the meantime, everybody in all floors of the clinic heard the blood-curdling screams. <laughs> okay, this is the child that we're dealing with. My husband and I desperately wanted to make a difference for the good in our daughter's life, to influence her to do the right thing. Well, this is what we figured out. One day, I called her into our bedroom and said, you know, honey, you really have been wanting to have something soft and furry as your own pet. Oh yeah, the eyes got big, the smile came. Something you can take care of, have as your own. Well, Dad and I would like to make an offer to you. And this is the offer. When you decide to suck your thumb only in your bedroom and keep your blanket there, we'll get you a kitten. It's all up to you. This is how it goes. So you make up your mind you're going to suck your thumb only in your bedroom. You notice it was positive. Keep your blanket there. We'll get the kitten. You'll need to show us that you can carry out this decision. So you'll need first to do that for three weeks. That's 21 days. So with a chart, we'll mark those days where you suck your thumb only in your bedroom. And uh, if you miss a day, then we'll have to start the chart over. Um, and as, you can do that whenever, whenever you want to decide that you're ready to do that. You want to do that. Um, after the 21 days are up, we will go to the Humane Society and you can pick out a kitten. I said, do you think about it? And she did think about it for about five seconds. And she said, let's make the chart. Okay. That's exactly what we did. And I want you to know that this little powerhouse <laughs> was successful beyond all belief with her endeavor to break this habit. Let me show you what she would do. She'd sit and watch TV with her, <laughs> holding her thumb between her knees <laughs> as hard as she could. And then when a commercial break came, she would run at the top, <laughs> top of her speed <laughs> into her bedroom and grab the blanket and get her little thumb-sucking fix and run back in time for the show to start again. Oh my God. That's what she did. And this went on, and the stickers went on, one by one by one. And I can say that she did not suck her thumb outside of her room. I mean, there was maybe a little cheating here and there. <laughs> From that point on, and of course it diminished even more. The kitten she picked out was gray, and we named her Hallie, and darned if that cat didn't live 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> we just laid old Hallie to rest this last fall <laughs> in the garden. It's true, it's true. <clears throat> now this story, besides being entertaining, <laughs> points to the key ingredient that I mentioned that's missing from many of our attempts to affect the way we want to influence people in our lives, at home, at work, our jobs, um, in our communities, in our political lives. You see, I listened to and sought to understand my seven-year-old daughter, instead of trying to make her do 
just do what I wanted, what I knew, and I really did know to be best. I also considered what I was willing to give up. <laughs> but most of important of all, I accepted who and where she was in her life and met her there. I left her free to choose, even as both my husband and I offered her a compelling reason to make that choice. This is what's left out in many of our misled efforts to make an impact on others. The art of influence is not about us, you and me. It's about taking the time and effort to listen to and seek to understand those we seek to change. My husband and I could have started World War IV with this little girl and her blanket. Believe me, we considered several ways to do that. Instead, we set aside being right long enough to allow her to influence us, and we shaped our approach accordingly. I am now serving as a representative in my first term, second session of the South Dakota Legislature. I am right about so many things. <laughs> oh, I am. Wow. <laughs> I cannot understand why someone could differ from me. But there's the invitation right there. Will I take time to learn and understand why it is someone takes a position different than mine? Will I even be interested in that? Will I make accusations and assertions about my opponent's brain power, motives, level of caring, or any other judgments I'd like to deliver? Or will I genuinely seek to discover who they are and what this position they've taken is all about? Will I get to know them? Is there a chance that they might get to know me? My efforts to argue almost always fail. My efforts to listen and understand, and then when some kind of respectful relationship has been developed, try to influence someone. When I do that, I often succeed. I do not get my own way. But sometimes, I've been able to work togethers, together with others whom I disagree to accomplish what we would both see as good. I continue to hear my colleagues, any side of the aisle, make assumptions and judgments about other legislators and their character and their positions. I am working to try to stop from doing this, stop myself. When we really want to influence someone, it can help so much to get to know and accept them on their own terms. Advertising companies endlessly survey their potential customers. And somewhere along the way, they found out that we really love to see babies, <laughs> small children, puppies, right? Does anybody know what the most popular Super Bowl ad was this year? Clydesdale and the, puppy. the puppy and the Clydesdale, <laughs> correct. That didn't happen by accident, did it? Budweiser got to know their audience. A few years ago, I was part of a graduate program in preaching and received a Doctor of Ministry degree. The basic premise I explored um, in that was in order to be successful, a preacher needs to consult the experts. And who are the experts? The listeners. I spent much time and effort in the church I was serving at that time, working with the members 
of the congregation both before I preached and then after I finished preaching a sermon for them. I got their help in trying to discover what was effective and life-changing in a message for them. Now I believe I've had a deep influence with some of my preaching, not all, on the lives of listeners through the years. I've been told as much. But the extent of that influence is in direct relationship to how well I knew and cared about those listeners. Now I teach preaching every other year at our local seminary to students that are on the non-parish pastor track. And the most common mistake by a beginning preacher is to focus only on the message that they have crafted and getting it just right and forgetting to even think about those listening to the sermon, their needs, desires, level of understanding, hopes, all of that. These new preachers think it's all about them. Our influence with others is severely diminished when it's only about us. Instead of slipping into our old habits of criticizing those with which we disagree and differ, focusing only on what we know to be right and what we have to say to the world, I hope you will consider joining me and getting to know, understand, and care about those we would like to change, taking time and effort to listen to and understand those with whom we disagree will provide a doorway for us to truly influence them and to be influenced by them for the good of all. Thank you. <laughs>